Um, okay, on to our last talk of this morning. Um, this is again pre-recorded as uh, Professor Keith Wilkinson is currently abroad. Um, Keith's Professor of Geoarchaeology at Winchester University and he's also the Director of ARCA, which is his department's commercial arm. And the work that Keith is going to be telling us about um, was part of the wider ongoing studies at Gloucester Castle, um, the, the prison site. Um, but he's got much to tell us about the development of that area before the castle, I understand. Uh, are you able to put the video on, please, Martin? My presentation is on the geoarchaeology of the former HMP Gloucester, and it reports results of work that we, Archa Geoarchaeology, undertook during the first six months of 2017. The slide shows the prison as it was when it was ceased being used in 2013, also how it looked in 2017 when we carried out our work, and also I believe how it looks at the present day. The intention is that the prison will be redeveloped as for residential purposes, retaining the Grade 2 star and Grade 2 listed buildings, demolishing much of the rest and replacing them with new structures. Sorry that I can't speak to you live, but when you listen to this, I shall be travelling. The next two slides show why the site is important. Firstly, the site is immediately to the west of the Roman city wall, as it's been projected from previous investigations and possibly encompasses two Roman keys, one dating from the first century and the other from the second and third centuries. And as is better known, this site also coincides with the early 12th century Norman castle, which is constructed. The dark green areas show the projected lines of the walls, the curtain walls mainly, and then the light green shaded area shows the areas of the ditch, which, as you'll see later, is significant as far as the geoarchaeology goes. So our task was to investigate the, the deeper archaeological layers on the site. The archaeological evaluation had, ex had um, excavated trenches between about 1.2 and in one case uh, just over two metres in depth. But obviously for health and safety reasons they were unable to extend those trenches any deeper and yet archaeological remains were still still present in those trenches. So working with Cotswold Archaeology and um, with Andrew Armstrong at the City Council and with advice from Hayley McParland of Historic England we developed a strategy to sample the site using uh, boreholes. So this a uh, map here shows the location of various types of boreholes. Those marked in blue, these are boreholes that have been drilled before our works and which we had access to the records. So most of these boreholes are provided either by Gloucester City Council um, and some are on the British Geological Survey database of boreholes. The boreholes in red are those that we drilled um, during the course of Jan works that we undertook in January 2017, and there are a total of uh, 13 of them. I've ringed two of those boreholes. You can see a dashed red line around uh, borehole 2 and borehole 11, and that is because at these boreholes we installed monitoring equipment that I'll talk about later. The boreholes were drilled uh, by a subcontractor, Geotechnical Engineering Limited, who are based in Quedgley, and they employed a Pioneer 2 uh, drilling rig. So uh, this type of drilling rig is one that we commonly use in our work. It's uh, petrol powered, diesel powered, sorry, um, and it drives a core chamber of 100 and, sorry, 112 millimetre diameter. Um, that can be uh, driven by percussive force, but if you hit a solid object, uh, it can be also advanced by rotary drilling. So this device will pretty much go through anything, as you'll, and I'll give you an example of what it's gone through later on in the in the talk. So you can see uh, you can see it here being used to drill borehole eight, and this device uh, was used to drill either through 
the backfill of Cotswold Archaeology's evaluation trenches, or in five instances, we excavated new test pits, which were monitored by staff of Cotswold Archaeology, backfilled, and then the this device drilled through the base of that um, backfilled area. And then cores, continuous cores were collected all the way from the uh, ground surface all the way until the geological um, bedrock, which in this case is the Charmouth um, mudstone formation, which is a Jurassic um, unit. The cores were then taken back to the, the Quedgley warehouse and in the warehouse, uh, my colleague and I from ARCA, we described those cores and we subsampled them for various types of analysis that I'll talk to you about later. And then cores that we thought were of particular interest, we transported back to, to Winchester for some geochemical work. In boreholes 2 and boreholes 11, we um, installed monitoring equipment. I say we, but in practice, that installation was carried out by um, Van Velt Limited. And you can see uh, Vincent Van Velt and Lewis Irvin of that organization installing the devices. So the devices comprise a, a, um, a sonde which measures the water uh, elevation, groundwater elevation in the borehole, and it also measures water temperature. And that device is then connected to a a sort of transmitter, which is effectively a mobile phone, which sits in the cabinet against the wall in this particular instance. And then that mobile phone connection transmits data that are collected every hour to a server hosted by Van Velt Limited, from which we could then extract the, the data. So what we were able to do then is we were able to monitor the movement of groundwater in the boreholes for a pit on an hourly basis and we did um, as well as temperature and we did that for uh, six months in the first part of 2017. The data on the right uh, show the information from the nearest weather station for which we could get information to Gloucester Prison which is not actually that close it's from Ross and Y and it it just shows you the the sort of temperatures and rainfall recorded over the six months that we we monitored. So the upper table shows you the um, those data for January to June 2017. Um, and what you can see from this is it was a very atypical year. We have relatively high rainfall in, in January, but lower than the long term average. But April, which is uh, tends to be a relatively wet month, was very dry in 2017. And conversely, May and June are very wet months in 2017, wetter than the long term average. The lower table shows you the, the long term average of, uh, of both temperature and also rainfall. So I'll begin discussing the results. So firstly, to start with the stratigraphy. So prior to our borehole survey, we knew quite a lot about the upper two metres of stratigraphy from previous evaluations. We knew a bit about lower stratigraphy from previous boreholes, but those most of those previous boreholes had not been monitored archaeologically. So this diagram on the left hand side shows a cross section from uh, east on the right hand side to west on the left hand side through the site. And the diagram, the map on the top right of the slide shows the position of that transect as that red line. So a few points to, to bear in mind. So first of all, if we look at the lowest unit that we see in the boreholes, which I've labelled Lias group, but is the Charmouth mudstone formation. So this is the, the geological bedrock. And you can see that that dips from uh, west, sorry, east of the site from around about 10 and a half metres above ordnance datum. It dips through the site to a minimum in, um, in the area of the, the prison house, which we didn't, couldn't actually drill because it's a current building. It, that's at around about five and a half metres. So we've got a dip of, what's that, um, five metres over a distance of perhaps 200 metres. 
Then above the uh, Lias group, the next unit that we have is something I've labeled the powerhouse member. So the powerhouse member is a, a sort of a recognized quaternary deposit. It's thought, it's thought to represent a mixture of uh, deposits forming by solid fluxion, so freeze-thaw processes called the Cheltenham Sands, but it also incorporates the, uh, some gravels that developed in the River Severn. And again, you can see that this, these sets of deposits dip in a similar sort of way. So they dip from the east to the west and they disappear from the central part of the, uh, the HMP Gloucester site. And then they appear again underneath the prism house and then in the area to the, the immediate west, but as a much thinner outcrop. So we don't know much about the chronology of these. Um, there's been no direct dating, but it's thought that the powerhouse member dates to the last glacial period. So we're probably talking in the order of 25,000 to, I don't know, 12,000 years ago. Then overlying the powerhouse member, we have something called the Elmore member. So the Elmore member uh, is a Holocene um, so dating from the last 11,700 years, a Holocene floodplain deposit uh, and, sorry, and other river deposits. We only have the Elmore member in the western part of the prison site and also in areas to the, the west of the prison. However, within the prison site, so in, for example, um, Borehole 4, the Elmore member contains fragments of brick and tile and so forth. So we think in the particular instance of the prison site, the Elmore member formed during the historic period, probably during the, the Roman times. Then overlying the Elmore member, we have really complex stratigraphy, which I've labeled here as archeological strata. And these deposits relate to the medieval and post-medieval use of the, of the um, area that's now the prison. So they mainly relate to the former castle. And you can see that these are relatively thick in the center of the prison site, and then they thin uh, to either side. In above that, we have made ground deposits. So made ground deposits I've defined as anything forming since AD 1800. So these relate to construction of the prison and demolition of various prison buildings. And you can see various uh, thicknesses of made ground across the site. So it's also possible to take all of the borehole data, including that those collected before our work, and to produce deposit models. So this particular deposit model, it shows the uh, thickness of archaeologically relevant deposits. So by archaeologically relevant, I mean that I've mapped as per the last figure as archaeological deposits and also the Elmore member, because remember the Elmore member uh, alluvium contains historic period uh, artifactual material. And this provides quite a, a good picture of, uh, of, of how that varies across the, the area of the prison. So first of all, we can see there's a general pattern of the thickness of archaeologically relevant material increasing as we go from east to west. And that, as you, can, you saw from that earlier illustration, is to some extent mirrors the, the uh, geological um, outcrop it follows that dip. So you can see that in the uh, eastern part of the site, we've got th about just over three meters of archaeologically relevant deposits. But by the time we get to the western perimeter, there's over six meters of um, deposits of archaeological importance. There are a couple of outliers which I need to explain to you. So Arca borehole 12 on the eastern most extremity of the prison site, we think that borehole passed through the uh, ditch of the medieval, the, the 12th century castle. So we've got thicker deposits of archaeological interest at that particular location. The other location I'll point out to you is Arca BH1 on the western part of the prison. This uh, borehole went, was drilled literally on top of a, uh, a post medieval wall and the borehole was advanced through that wall for several meters. So 
when we came to sample the court, examine the cores, we found that we had several meters of brick in those cores. So it looks as if there's a great thickness of archaeological deposits in that borehole, but in practice, uh, they're not of particular interest. It's just a wall that has been cored. On the cores that we took back to Winchester, we carried out some geochemical tests using a portable X-ray fluorescence device. And this shows the record of the measurements we made through borehole two, which is on the eastern part of the site, sorry, western part of the site. I'm not going to spend, you'll be pleased now, I'm not going to spend very long talking about this, but the, the records from the base of the borehole are from the Charmouth mudstone formation, so they reflect the properties of the bedrock. Then we go through the Elmore member, which, as I've already uh, explained to you, contains historic period artefacts, I think is mainly a Roman layer. There's no archaeological deposits were sampled in this core. And then we've got some from the 19th and 20th century made ground. So I'll pick out uh, two patterns from, from this core. So the first one is the uh, record for zinc, which is chemical element ZN. You can see that in the made ground, uh, ZN has uh, much higher readings than for any other part of the stratigraphy. And we think this is because of the use of zinc in metallurgy during the 19th and 20th century. It's, it's a, an element that is used to a much greater extent in this uh, modern period than previously. More important, however, is the, uh, the data for lead, which is the column on the extreme right. And you can see that in the Lias group deposits, lead uh, levels are extremely low. In fact, you can barely see the bars representing lead in the, in the Lias group samples. However, as we go into the Elmore member, you can see that lead increases. And we think this is the use of lead as a, as a material for construction and making artifacts in the Roman period and that that is being reflected in the geochemical record of alluvium that is produced. So it could well be, and we've seen this in other cities as well, that lead is a chronological, the increases in lead are a chronological marker for the Roman period. We also conducted um, bioarchaeological works in on three of the boreholes, the ones I've ringed in green on this map here. And we looked at plant macro remains, we looked at pollen, and we looked at diatoms. I say we, but in fact, that work was carried out by Quest at the University of Reading. The results of that demonstrate most of the work we carried was carried out on the Elmore member. Uh, but in the case of borehole five, we also looked at archaeological deposits. Unfortunately, preservation in the archaeological deposits in borehole five was very poor, so we can't say very much about um, that. However, in borehole two and borehole 13, we have very good pollen and diatom preservation. So in the case of diatoms, we didn't uh, examine, identify particular species. We just saw that the preservation was very good and therefore the potential for further work is also good. The pollen data, however, were examined and pollen grains were counted, very few in each case. And it would appear that the Elmore member here accumulated in an environment that was, was largely open. So we have the area surrounding the site will have been of open vegetation, grassland and sort of ruderals. Um, no real indications for arable agriculture. There are occasional stands of trees, and those trees we know were oak and lime, but also there was alder, which probably fringed, fringed the river. So it was, it's undoubtedly an environment that has been impacted by humans who've cleared most of the woodland, and uh, what's left is just these isolated stands. So the monitoring data for, for us, the um, most innovative part of the project, we, this was our first um, hydrogeological study. Uh, we were sort of, to a certain extent, developing approaches that we've used in, in later projects. So this diagram here plots the results of groundwater levels in um, borehole 11, which is the black line on the upper part of the diagram, 
and borehole 2, the blue line, um, against the rainfall data from Ross on Y. So that is shown on the top and you can see these sort of where the bars extend uh, downwards that indicates particular rainfall events that are measured in millimeters. And as you can see, April, as I already said, was a very dry month. But we do have these intense rainfall events in May and to a certain extent in June as well, relatively unusual. And it's also very clear from the groundwater data how the latter respond to those rainfall events. And you can see peaks in groundwater elevation as a result of rainfall events before levels sink back to, to how they were previously. So my colleague uh, Tom Ball, the University of Winchester, he's done quite a bit of work interpreting these data. And what he sees is that in the early part of the year, the um, magnitude of change in borehole 2 on the western side of the site is generally greater than borehole 11. And he thinks this is largely because the river levels are relatively low at this point because of relative lack of rain. However, in, from June onwards, the reverse happens that, in fact, it's borehole 11 which sees the greater magnitude of changes. And this is a result of borehole 2, any changes in that being swamped by effects from the river. So in this diagram, I've tried to put together evidence from the examination of biological remains that I've previously discussed and plotted that against the stratigraphy, but also the hydrological data that I discussed under the past um, previous slide. <clears throat> so in this diagram, uh, bars that are represented by dark green are where we've got good waterlogged preservation of pollen in this case, and diatoms, areas that are in brown, um, sorry, sorry, rectangles in brown are where we get poor preservation of um, pollen and um, plant macrofossils. So the first thing to say, of course, is that good biological preservation occurs deep down the, in the Elmore member. And the evidence is that the water tape, groundwater, um, is always above the, at least during our monitoring period, was always above the level of the Elmore member. So the Elmore member is permanently waterlogged. And the water table rather fluctuates within the archaeological strata except in the case of um, borehole 2 on the extreme uh, western part, but otherwise it fluctuates within the archaeological strata. And that's probably why the uh, organic remains in the archaeological strata were found to be very poorly preserved and have low potential. So the sort of message of this slide is that the Elmore member, um, although not strictly an archaeological deposit, but it does, and, and it's alluvium, but it does have paleoenvironmental significance because of its good preservation as a result of being permanently waterlogged. So this has been a whistle-stop tour through the methods and results of the work we conducted during 2017 at the former HMP Gloucester. And what I've tried to do is sum up some of the key findings and their implications on this slide. So the top bullet point um, we found that these are the thicknesses of archaeologically relevant deposits that occur on the site. And of course, as I've sort of emphasised towards the beginning of the lecture, on the basis of prior archaeological investigation by traditional means, we knew simply that archaeological materials extended to at least two metres. So we now can calibrate that and definitively say that in some locations, on the eastern, sorry, western part of the site, we've got up to six and a half metres of, of deposits which are of archaeological significance. We've also confirmed as a result of our work that not only are deposits that formed directly by human activity, mainly within the Rome, uh, medieval castle, not only are they of archaeological importance, but we also have these alluvial deposits which seem to be of Roman date and which most likely formed in association with the Roman keys, which we didn't find in the boreholes, unsurprisingly, and which couldn't be found in the archaeological trenches because they likely lie too deep. And those alluvial deposits of the Elmore member 
they do contain well-preserved um, organic materials. Those organic materials have the potential to provide uh, information about the environment in which uh, activity in Roman Gloucester took place, but it's also highly likely that paleoeconomic um, um, preservation information is available from those as well. It's likely that plant macro fossils might be preserved in those deposits and we know from other records in the vicinity of the uh, prison that, uh, that shell, the remains of shellfish exist in those deposits. We only conducted water table monitoring for six months but based on that, those six months of evidence even though it may not be typical it would seem that the water table fluctuates within the archaeological deposits, which we think are mainly medieval, and that that fluctuation explains the relatively poor waterlogged preservation in the in medieval strata. However, the water table lies entirely above the, the levels we think are Roman, so hence why the waterlogged preservation is much likely to be better in those Roman layers, which in this case are of the Elmore member. OK, thank you for listening to me. My last slide will simply um, acknowledge the various people involved in the project who've helped and um, made the whole investigation a, a, an ex interesting experience. Thank you for listening and apologies that I can't take any questions. Well, thank you to Keith in his absence. Um, a fascinating and extremely varied um, session of talks this morning. Um, thank you for those of you that have put questions in. Um, please feel free to keep them coming.